swashbucklers, you're listening to Under the Crossbones. My name is Phil Johnson. I am your host for the show. Thank you for tuning in to episode number 85. Thank you for listening and uh, for telling your friends and all that kind of good stuff because you uh, keep the ship afloat. That's what you do. My guest on the show today is Alan Baylog, who is the author of a cool book called Black Sails 1715. Now, I know what you're thinking. First of all, Black Sails TV show, right? No. Uh -uh. Uh, What the book is about is the 1715 Spanish treasure fleet, which sunk off the coast of Florida and all the uh, plundering and stuff that went along with that, which included pirates and the Spanish government and all that kind of stuff. But one of the ships in the 1715 fleet, which, as you'll hear in the interview, was the Urca de Lima. So it is actually kind of uh, tangentially connected to the TV show Black Sails. Uh, And he was working on the book at the same time, like before the show came out and all that kind of stuff. We'll get into that. It's a good interview. You are going to dig it. Speaking of Black Sails, did you watch the final episode? I'm having like a uh, series uh, withdrawal now. You know when like like you finish a series and you go, oh man, the series is over. And then you're just like, you're a little bit bummed, right? You might be a lot bummed, a lot bit bummed. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a little bummed because I watched it this morning. Uh, I had it on my DVR and uh, I watched it this morning. And I won't give any spoilers if you haven't seen it yet really good i thought it was a great way to end the series uh they did a good job but it happens every time like the sopranos ended right and you were like oh man there's no more sopranos and breaking bad ended and you're like oh man there's no more breaking bad and then black sales ended and you're like ah oh, there's no more black sales it's a little bit of a bummer um but uh who knows maybe they'll do some things in the future i mean we've all said we'd really like to see a reboot of treasure island right like i'm not for reboots uh at all usually but uh a New Treasure Island with those actors in it would be fantastic. Um, anyway, so uh, if you if you haven't watched it yet, you're gonna you're I think you'll enjoy it. I think the last episode was done really really well, tied things up nicely, and uh, and there's a few cool little Easter eggery nuggets in there uh, for us pirate fans that I think you'll dig. So, uh, but I you know what I didn't I didn't do any shows over the last uh, week or so. Uh, I took a little time off, but going on the road again soon. We'll talk about that in a, in a second. What I did yesterday. I went to a movie for the first time in a long time. Uh, my girl and I went and saw Logan, the the um, uh, the Wolverine. Yeah, couldn't think of the. I'm not a comic book guy. The Wolverine uh, movie, the, the last Wolverine movie, very last. Because uh, if you haven't seen it, I won't uh, spoil it for. It's been out a month. If you're gonna see it, you've probably seen it anyway. But it's definitely the last Wolverine movie. And uh, so we went to see that. My girlfriend, big Wolverine fan, so she was bummed because uh, it's a pretty depressing ending. And so after that, uh, we snuck in to see Beauty and the Beast, uh, which would have been my initial choice of movie uh, thing. So we got a two for one. Beauty and the Beast, fantastic. Wonderfully done. Um, it's one of the, of course, one of the best Disney films uh, that Disney has made in their careers as a company. And uh, this one, uh, I don't like the, I don't like the idea of the live action reboot of these things. I saw Jungle Book and I was like, okay, they did it different enough where they weren't trying to do it. Uh, I didn't see the Cinderella one. Uh, and so I was a little interested in Beauty and the Beast because I thought uh, Emma Watson, great choice to play Belle. And it looks like they were going to do a good job with it. And they really, really did. I was pretty darn impressed with it, uh, even down to particular camera angles and things from the animated movie that they used in the live action one. But they filled it out with some extra scenes and some extra um, uh, information uh, that really, I thought, built the uh, character definition to a, a, a finer point, uh, and I thought it was really good. So uh, it's it's making a whole bunch of money at the box office for a reason. So if you haven't seen Beauty and the Beast yet and you're a Disney fan, or even if you're not, uh, I, I say go check that one out. Um, Logan, uh, I guess, yeah, if you want to be bummed out at the end, go see Logan. It was good. It was good. I'll give him that. It was good. Uh, and uh, like I'll tell you what, if you like uh stranger things go see logan <laughs> uh there's a little girl in it it reminded me uh, of of the stranger things little girl you know uh so i just i had my lunch and i've been getting this um this uh uh salad stuff from costco uh it's all crunchy things and it. it's kale and chicory and and pumpkin seeds and all kinds of stuff and and uh, i realized a, a while back a couple weeks ago I was getting this persistent metal taste in my mouth. I'm still not quite sure what it is, but I had this persist- persistent metally taste in my mouth, like I was sucking on pennies, you know. And uh, I was talking about it with my girlfriend, and she was like, "Well, maybe maybe you're allergic to something. Maybe it's an allergy." Uh, and she said, "Have you what have we, what have you been eating different lately?" I said, "Well, the only thing different I've changed is this. I changed salad mixes at Costco uh, that I have for lunch." She goes, "Well, maybe it's that." Uh, so I took a couple weeks off of that. 
and the metally taste went away. And uh, and uh, now I started eating it again just to see, and it's starting to come. Here's short, long story short. I think I'm allergic to kale, which is that not the greatest allergy ever? It's like being allergic to hard work. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Allergic. Uh, yeah, I think I'm allergic to kale, which is that's that's awesome. I'm 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 proud of myself uh, for being allergic to kale. Uh, it shows that I have some sort of uh, moral fiber, uh, if not dietary fiber. So there you go. Uh, tour is coming up this week, and uh, it is coming up quick. I'm packing for it. Uh, you out in the Midwest, there, come on out and see a show. Uh, Friday and Saturday, April seventh to eighth, I will be at Danger Fields in Shakopee, Minnesota. Sunday, April 9th, I will be at the End Zone in Delavan, Wisconsin. Uh, Monday, April the 10th, I will be hanging around Chicago, and I don't know where, uh, but chances are there will be an Italian beef sandwich in my hand if you catch me. Uh, if you're in Chicago in that area and you want to host a house concert for me that night, get in touch. We'll do that. We can do it last minute even if you've got some friends you want to bring around. Tuesday, April the 11th, I will be at Smokestack Brew in Mishawaka, Indi- uh, Indiana. Mishawaka, Indiana. Wednesday, April the 12th, I will be at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, that's the only date I'm not headlining on this tour. I'm featuring uh, for my buddy Grant Lyon on that one. It's going to be super fun. You should come out because we're both awesome. Uh, thir- Thursday, April the 13th, Mandan, North Dakota at a place called Rock Point. Uh, and Friday, April the 14th, I will be at Piggies in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Sounded like I missed a letter or a syllable in there wisconsin yeah piggies lacrosse wisconsin all right and then uh back here in california saturday april the 29th i'll be at the tasting room in fresno california so come and see a show It'll, it'll be fun i got lots of new material and if you're enjoying this show and i hope you are come uh, join us on facebook where right now we're commiserating about the end of black sales uh facebook.com slash under the crossbones on twitter catch us at under crossbones no the in that one and if you are not yet subscribed to the show why not it's the easiest way to get all the new shows without having to think about it uh get it on uh you know itunes stitcher uh slacker uh iheart radio all them places whatever your podcatcher is podcast addict uh that's the one i use podcast uh uh, something, uh, they all have podcasts in the name. So whatever your podcasty thing is, make sure you subscribe to the show there. And of course you can get all the, the, uh, notes for this show at under the crossbones.com slash zero eight five. Uh, if you want to help support the show, that would be awesome of you. It really would. You can, uh, 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 uh give a donation, right? Go to under the crossbones.com slash support. There's a little PayPal box. You can donate any amount of money that you want there. Uh, any amount of, uh, number of digits that you want there. Uh, one digit is okay. Two digits. Now we're talking three digits. Oh yeah. Four digits. I'll buy you dinner. All right. Cause I'm not a cheap date. <laughs> There's also an Amazon banner on that page where you can click that banner, buy yourself something nice at Amazon, like maybe black sale, 1715, this awesome book by Alan Baylog that you're going to hear about in a moment, buy yourself something nice at Amazon. Amazon kicks me back a few shekels, uh, and it, uh, helps support the show. If you want to be a sponsor, of the show. That's cheap and easy. Uh, you just contact me from there. We'll get you hooked up. All right. We are going to dig into uh, the interview now with uh, author, author of Black Sail 1715. And uh, we're talking about the 1715 Spanish treasure fleet crashed off the coast of Florida. Here's Alan Baylog. Enjoy. So uh, you're an author. And uh, you are a retired history teacher. And your current book, Black Sail 1715, uh, centers around the 1715 Spanish treasure fleet. So give us a thumbnail sketch of what that uh, that historical story is about that treasure sure. fleet and how it went down. Absolutely. Yeah, well, th- well uh, first, uh, thank you for the interview. Oh, absolutely. Uh, this is my first podcast. Very, very cool on nice. uh, Pirate Radio. Um, having said that, the, uh, the backdrop um, is it's historic fiction based on fact. Um, I do throw dialogue in there based upon what I think they may have said to each other based upon my um, history and uh, world history and U.S. history background. Mm-hmm. And I think I have a very, very good feel for what they may or may not have said to one another. Again, and again, it's, uh, it's all based upon experience. Uh, sure. The, uh, the backdrop is, um, is the 1715 fleet um, – had left Havana, Cuba uh, on July 24th. There were 11 Spanish galleons in the fleet, and uh, they were en route back to Spain. And they were got caught up in a 
a horrific uh, hurricane off of the east coast of Florida, primarily between Fort Pierce Inlet and Sebastian Inlet. Uh, currently, those two inlets are man-made inlets, but that's basically where the uh, the 11 Spanish guns went down in the hurricane. Okay. The interesting part to that is the fact that on board, uh, there is $16 million in gold and silver and emeralds. And that was primarily going to be used to finance the war against England in Europe. It was known as the War of Spanish Succession. Mm-hmm. And in the U.S., we knew it as Queen Anne's War. Right. Uh, having said that, around 2 o'clock in the morning, On July 30th, 31st, um, they had arrived off the east coast of Florida is when the hurricane hit. And lost in the the fleet was, um, again, the 16 million in gold and silver and emeralds, uh, along with 1,500 passengers that were on board, Mm -hmm. as much as 2,000. The the best guesstimate is about 1,500 which is kind of the interesting uh, scenario, Phil, is because we knew what was on the ships because of the manifests. Oh, okay. We know very, very, yeah, it's interesting, but we know very little about the people who were actually on board. Right. And so uh, my my sequel to the, uh, is a follow-up, um, doing as much research as I can on finding out, well, who are the people on board? We oh, know that, yeah. we know, yeah, we know the cargo is on board, down to cocoa leaves, literally. Huh. Uh, and coquineal and uh, all the different types of cargo they were taking back to Europe. But we know very little about the people themselves. Yeah. Were they, so, the, I mean, do the, the people on board, would that have mostly been crew, that 1,500 people, or was, were they passenger ships as well? It's a combination of both more passengers than crew. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, but the interesting part of that is the, uh, there were either very, very wealthy people on board or they are very, very poor. Right. And, uh and so there, there was an in, in between. It was a, a middle class, so to speak. Uh, again, you're very, very wealthy, or you, you're you're extremely poor, sure. and you're, you're headed back to Spain. Okay. So the ships go down in this hurricane, uh, ruining a good night's sleep right in the middle of the night. And uh, and then what's that? What's the next part? Where where do where's the uh, the salvaging come in and such? Well, what happened at that point in time? It had to be horrendous, if you can imagine. Um, Roughly 1,200 uh, uh, people being washed up on the shore mm-hmm. at daybreak, uh, and so the 1,500 is estimate around uh, 1,200 uh, perished. Mm. Um, so it had to be horrific. Sure. And much like us, uh, the same needs and same wants. You would have um, grandmas and grandbabies on board, and and merchantmen and uh, citizens uh, again very wealthy. Sure. Uh, but to be caught up in a hurricane at two o'clock in the morning at a, on a rickety old ship it must have been horrifying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then if you're yeah, very hor- and then if you're lucky enough to live, uh, keep in mind now you would have carnage spread from the Fort Pierce Inlet all the way up to Sebastian Inlet. You know, hundreds of people laying on uh, on the beach, uh-huh. uh, drowned or or. Uh, or severe injuries that would cause a death. And so uh, it would have been a, just an absolute nightmare uh, to go through that and to see loved ones being uh, washed overboard and into the churning water. Sure. So it just an absolute hor- horrifying experience for those who are on board. Now, if you are lucky enough to live, no food, no water. Uh-huh. Now you're looking at the first week of August in tropical heat. <laughs> And the humidity, and the mosquitoes would have been would have been horrific, right? And what, what we call no CMs as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there's uh, verifiable stories that have been told whereby they would um, put their children in, in in a hole in the sand and dig that first, and then put the kids in that hole and bury them up to their neck, so the mosquitoes wouldn't get to them. Oh, geez. Yeah, really. And then on top of that, keep in mind, just to reiterate, no food, no water, uh, dehydration. Uh Um, You're in shock. You see relatives, friends uh, laying beside you that are now deceased um, or badly broken bones or 
uh, parts of the wood of the hull um, being washed up on shore. Uh-huh. Uh, just an absolute nightmare. Um, then, um, on the island itself, the I Indians, and it's spelled A I S, the okay. I Indians were the inhabitants at that time. Some helped, and quite frankly, some, very few, but some were cannibals. So huh. you didn't know. <laughs> so when the in, when, yeah, when the I Indians approached you, you didn't know if they were friend or foe. Right. So again, and again, another horrifying ex- experience. At that, at that point in time, um, Admiral Simone, it's spelled S A L M O N, took control because okay. uh, General Ubilla, U B I L L A, and General Echevers, E C H E V E R Z, uh-huh. were the um, were the respective um, captains, commanders of the uh, of the fleet. Okay. Uh, and then uh, they both perished uh, offshore during the hurricane. Uh, Simone had taken charge of the fleet and what was left over. And currently, it's called the McClarty Museum, if I may spell it, M-C-L-A-R-T-Y. Uh, that is just south of the Sebastian Inlet in Vero Beach. And they okay. have a wonderful museum there with the history and artifacts. And I highly recommend anyone listening um, to your program to uh, pay a visit to the McClarty Museum. Nice. In Vero Beach. All right. And, uh, on my list. So, uh, it, yeah, on your list. And uh, the uh, irony of that location is that is where, with, uh, with an eye shot, is where they started to stockpile uh, the gold and the silver as okay. much as they possibly could. Uh-huh. Is right there, uh, right there by the museum as well. And is that washing up on the shore too? As we speak, we're back in those Back in those days, so I mean, how are how are they? I mean, if there's oh. kind of trying to grab it at the time, or oh, uh, yeah, great question again, Phil. Um, what occurred was the, they would the Spanish naval forces came in as well, uh-huh. and um, they would either use um, local natives and also um, the slaves would come up uh, out of um, out of Jamaica as well, and they oh, would right. use the slaves to to free dive into uh, roughly um, thirty five to fifty feet of water. Oh wow! Okay, and then they, and, th- and then they were they were bringing the, uh, the 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 what was available the treasure up and loaded on stockpile and then obviously take it into shore. Gotcha. And where there's a stockpile, and then and what happened there is um, there's a lot of um, age of piracy in the uh, novel as well. Okay. Uh, Nassau Bahamas was the pirate haven at that time. Sure. Roughly two two thousand pirates lived. In Nassau. Yep. And um, as soon as the word got out that the 1715th Fleet went down in a hurricane, it was now like ants on candy. <laughs> uh, and the words, yeah, the word spread very quickly throughout Jamaica and throughout the Bahamas and also into the new colonies as well. Uh-huh. And then the next thing uh, off the coastline were the uh, pirates um, waiting for the Spanish to sell as much as they could. And then they went on land and stole it off of them. Oh, they did it the easy way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did it the easy way. We'll sit here and let's sit here offshore and uh, let's watch them do all the work. <laughs> and when they're done with it, we'll go in and, uh, and take what we want. And his name was, um, was Captain Henry Jennings. Uh-huh. And his quartermaster at that time and another sh- was uh, a, a, uh, a ruthless pirate by the name of Charles of Dane. Sure. V A I N. I'm sorry, V A N E. Yep. Charles of Dane was probably um, the guy was brutal. Uh, he would kill women and children just to watch them die. Uh-huh. So he's more of a psychopath, a criminal psychopath, quite frankly. But he's sure. he's 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 the worst of the worst. But uh, they were financed by the, uh, the by Jamaica. The, uh, his name was Lord Hamilton. Okay. And Lord Hamilton was the governor of Jamaica at that time. So he financed. Uh, a typical politician, almost uh, more, but he would look for lobbyists, modern-day lobbyists, so to speak. Uh-huh. But he financed the operation for um, Captain Jennings and Charles Bain to leave Jamaica and uh, and sail to uh, Vero, modern-day Vero Beach. Okay. And that's where they also hung offshore as well. Right. And they probably, you know, it was right around uh, 325 men that were with them. So it was, it was, it was a pretty, pretty... Um, uh, the offense was against the Spanish Navy was going to be um, something to see for sure. 
Definitely, yeah. And those trying to recover the uh, as much treasure as possible. Uh, there's an interesting story as well that uh, two pirates came down from Cape Cod, uh-huh. and um, they hung offshore as well. And his name was, eventually we knew him as Black Sam Bellamy. Oh, okay, sure. And then Black Sam Bellamy um, had a friend by the name of Paul's Grave Williams. Uh-huh. Uh, Black Sam was a very poor sailor out of um, Cape Cod, um, but his friend Paul's Grave William had um, some money. His parents were uh, in the jewelry business in, in, in Boston. Okay. That's how bands get started. Yeah. So the next <laughs> thing here, here, you know, here, 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 so here we go. Um, so like I said, it's hands on candy. And, uh, and they, they heard about it in, in, in the... Uh, in the colony states, and next thing, uh, uh, th- these these two um, came down to um, the coast, east coast, and Long Vero Beach as well. Uh-huh. The interesting about that story is the fact that they hung off even further than Captain Jennings and Charles Vane. Okay, and their ship was their ship was called Barsheba. Uh-huh. If anyone wants to look it up, B A R S H E B A Barsheba. Okay, at that point in time, um, Jennings and Vane um, they sent a fleet of five ships and along with, with roughly um, 250 men. Okay. And they raided, they raided the, uh, the stockpile of gold and silver, again, right there at the McClarty Museum. Okay. And uh, roughly 400,000 pesos. Wow. That they, that they were headed on back to uh, Jamaica. Okay. There was a side story to that as well. Uh, Black Sam Bellamy and Paul's Grave Williams now follow Captain Jennings, and Charles of Ain. Okay. And they get into the Florida Straits, and uh, and then on their on their uh, very very close to the uh, uh, the coastline of Cuba. Uh-huh. And then Charles Vane and uh, Jennings got sick and tired of these two guys, who they did not know. Right. Uh, following them all the way down through the Florida Straits. <laughs> and so they did a one eighty and fired on uh, off of Bathsheba and fired at. Black Sam and, and Paul's Grave Williams, in other words, to back off. Okay. Uh, and they didn't. And uh, there's a wonderful story of the novel. And what happens in, in the end, essentially, is the fact that they were going to become partners. Oh, okay. On a French, yeah, on a French ship that was also loaded with gold and silver. Right. That was docked, docked off, off of Cuba as well. Okay. So as they um, as they joined forces and they raided the French ship, uh, while they were doing that, Black Sam Bellamy and Paul's grave unloaded the four hundred thousand pesos that Jennings and Vane had stolen from the Spanish stockpile, okay. <laughs> and they loaded it on their own ship and then took <laughs> off. So you had now you have pirates pirates pirating each other. Right. <laughs> Who knew they were dishonest? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a tongue-in-cheek, uh, marvelous story, which is in the novel uh-huh. in detail. But uh, that's one of my favorite parts is uh, the pirates stealing from each other and then and then uh, seeking um, uh, protection uh, back in Nassau. Right. That's, uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. And uh, what, what happened there also, uh, Phil, is... Uh, on the way back, of course, uh, they were pursued by Captain Jennings and, and Charles Vane. Uh-huh. And then who they encounter is Benjamin Hornigold. Ah, okay, yep. Benjamin Hornigold was was the, was the, was the man. Right. He was the he was the master of the seas, and um, and Benjamin Hornigold um, would teach uh, how to be literally be a pirate uh-huh. uh, as far as intimidation or, or boarding a ship. Right. But Benjamin Hornigold was. Um, uh, the interesting thing about Benjamin, as an, another side story, is the fact that he would never fire on a, an English ship because he had tremendous respect uh, for the king and queen. Sure. And he, finally, he was finally dis- dis- disposed from his ship because of it. His, his men had mutinied uh, against him. Uh-huh. Um, but what happened, uh, going back uh, uh, to what I was originally discussing, is that um, Benjamin Hornigold... Um, uh, despised Captain Jennings, and he despised, really despised Charles Vane because he was such a awful person. Right. And so Jennings is watching this pursuit uh, of Barsheba, uh-huh. and they're going after uh, Captain Sam Bellamy and Paul's Grave Williams. And uh, as soon as um, Captain Jennings saw what was going on, he uh, took the side of um, of Black Sam Bellamy huh. and, and Paul's Grave. He fired on 
uh, Captain Jennings trying to do the handmail. They, you know, look, look, these guys are not my friends. You need to right. back off. Yeah. <laughs> Black Sam Bellamy, by the way, um, he was the wealthiest pirate of all time. Really? Uh, yes. He was. Uh, this is his net worth. Um, this is not my numbers. This came out of Forbes magazine <laughs> uh, back in the 2008. Yeah. Um, but Paul Black Sam Bellamy was. Um, his wealth was right around 120 million. Wow. In today's current in today's currency. Yep. He he did a good job. He did. Yeah. I mean, he <laughs> was he was the. Uh, he was kind of what they call the Robin Hood of the seas as well. I mean, he would, uh, uh, like Robin Hood, on many occasions, he was um, he would give back to those who needed. Okay. So there's a good side to Black Sam, but for the most part, pirates are just the, the most horrible people, uh, the worst of the worst in, in society. Yeah, yeah. Terrible, definitely. horrible. I just, uh, Did Hornigold eventually sort of turn tail and become a pirate hunter, or am I mixing up my fiction with my history? No, how do you? I don't know how you knew that, Phil. But yes, exactly. Okay. So at this point, um, that's when, awesome that you knew that. Yeah. So when he's doing this, is he which which end is he on of that spectrum? At, at that point in time, he was still a pirate. Okay. Um, but then the um, the they were just sick and tired of the pirates disrupting the economy. Sure. Of England, and disrupting mm-hmm. the economy of Spain, um, and so Horn of Gold. Um, Cut a deal. Okay. And uh, he became a pirate hunter. Yeah. Interestingly enough. And so that was later. Yeah, that was later. Actually, okay. it's much later because what happened was that when Horny Gold's men mutinied against him, Black Sam Bellamy became the captain of, of his ship. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then Black Sam, of course, uh, then he, he made his friend Paul's Gray Williams uh, a quartermaster. Mm hmm. Uh, so at that point in time, uh, they, they went back to Nassau and, um, and they gave. Uh, Benjamin Hornigold, uh, carte blanche, uh, to go out and seek as many pirates as you possibly could and bring them back. Okay. And back, back to Nassau, uh, for the most part to be executed. Yeah, of course. Of course. So now in your book, you, instead of, uh, basically you, instead of just writing a history book, a dry history book, which I'm sure you've had plenty of experience teaching out of, you took it and made it a story and put dialogue and things like that, right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, again, it's, uh, history as you say, a dry history uh-huh. that through descriptions and depictions and what were literally, um, and this is not my words, these are other editors' words that make them jump off the page okay. and, and they became they become alive uh, and, and hold the, you know, the, uh, the reader's interest. Certainly, yeah. And hopefully to the point mostly, you know, they wouldn't put the book down. Yeah, but so, yeah, that's exactly what I did. That's great. And it was all based upon dialogue, yeah, what, what they probably said to each other. Uh-huh. Do I know? Of course not. Of course, yeah. But I can, I can, I can give an educated guess as to what they probably said to one another. So it's, it's a wonderful story. It really is. So it's a great, great story. Hopefully someday there'll be a, a documentary or a movie made out of it. Sure. Uh, as we speak, some friends of mine, um, treasure hunters, uh-huh. uh, pulled up four point five million in gold. Nice. Off the coast of Vero Beach in on, uh, in July of uh, 2015, uh-huh. and the uh, the irony of that is the fact that everyone thinks it's you know way offshore, it's a mile out, it's three miles out, and uh, uh-huh. and it's just not the case. Uh, most of the treasure being found in this case here, uh, it was found in waist high water. You could uh, about 100 feet 100 feet offshore. Oh wow! You could literally walk to it. Oh, that's crazy. You could literally walk to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Now, uh, I, I was reading about who's the, the the company that's got the salvage rights on that right now. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, as we speak, it's Queen's um, Jewel. Right now, that lease was purchased from the Fisher Estate. Okay, and a, a gentleman by the name of Brisbane uh, had purchased that B R I S B E N, and he is part of the uh, crew that put a tremendous amount of. Um, knowledge and background and uh and resources and financial resources and uh a very they had a very sophisticated operation and and uh, hats off to them they, they did a great job uh in the same breath um this is past month um that lease is being negotiated by a, a group of new investors oh really okay yes and it, it, it's going on as we speak and do they think there's still quite a bit of stuff down there to be salvaged I mean, it was eleven ships, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna throw a number out to you. Uh, and this is not my, uh, this is not my guess. These are though, these are numbers that um, 
of people in the know. Sure. And it's estimated at right about a half a billion with a B. Wow. That's still out there. Oh, interesting. Today's numbers. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. So let's let's go back in your story a little bit. You uh, you were a history teacher uh, as a career. So I imagine you had um, – were, were you looking at history books at that time like I was and, and looking at them and going, this is really dry. The stories are here, but nobody's telling the stories. That's the way I always kind of looked at history books. What occurred in my personal circumstance was about 1985, I was uh, reading um, some documents uh, put out by a, a cartographer, uh-huh. and his name was Bernard Romans, R-O-M-A-N-S. Mm-hmm. And Bernard Romans was sent here to do a survey of the area, and that was in 1774. Okay. And so Bernard Romans, his map was astounding to me, and those who are uh, familiar with the 1715 fleet, uh-huh. uh, likewise as well. That's kind of our precipitous saying, holy moly, this stuff is our back door, are you kidding me? <laughs> so um, so that his map uh, uh, showed the, um, the Sebastian um, Creek okay. uh, and extended all the way down to... Um, South of uh, modern day Stewart, Florida, uh-huh. and the and here's another historical um, tongue in cheek. Uh, the engraving of his maps uh, was done by Paul Revere. Oh, so I was I was thought I was thought that was fascinating. Interesting. That, that's the business of yeah. Paul Revere was actually in the business of uh, of map making oh, as well. I did not know that. So uh, anyway, going back to 1985, uh, it just my research and reading his um, narratives, I'm thinking to myself, oh, oh my gosh, the, 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 you know, one of these ships is in, in, it, literally in our back door. Right. And so uh, in 85 and 86 and 87, um, when we could, myself and two others, uh, we, and, and we had no clue uh, what we were doing. Uh-huh. But we did go out and look and uh, and using a small ski boat and uh, with ski rope, and then we would uh, traverse the area okay. looking for ballast piles of rock or, or, or cannon. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and we came up empty, but uh, regardless, uh, the evidence was there that one of the ships um, was probably south of Stewart Inlet mm. in an area of Florida called Hobe Sound. Okay. So it's 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 a it's a and the ship is probably the Arca de Lima. Oh, okay. Which we're all now familiar with from Black Sails. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Correct. So that's interesting. You said that because the cast and characters that are in the Caribbean were actually here on the 1715 fleet. Right. Yep. So yeah, in, in the stairs, they continually to look for the Arca de Lima. That's a ship that they want. Yep. That was a real ship. Yes. With a real name. Yep. Although from, from what I read, that ship actually wasn't that particular ship wasn't carrying a lot of, uh, uh monetary valuables, but more, uh, that's, that's cloth correct. And things. It was more yeah. of a cargo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly, it was more of a cargo ship than than anything else, but still had uh, I had I had the manifest of it, and it still had plenty of uh, of um, valuables on it. Oh, Whether okay. it's worked to silver or uh, they had chest of indigo, uh-huh. okay, uh, ceramic on drinking vessels, chocolate, cocoa, vanilla. And it had 136 chests of gifts on it, and but it goes on and on. A lot sure. of um, 32 chests of, of Chinese porcelain, uh-huh. which is huge. I mean, that's it, that's just a uh, the Chinese porcelain alone is a is a fascinating story as well. Sure. Huh. So again, I, 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 this is a, a movie to be made. Uh, it's true. Sure. Um, and 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 what happened between 1715 and the 1960s? This 1715 fleet that like disappeared from the history books. Interesting. It's not even in the history books. Huh. And it's one of the greatest maritimes disasters of all time. Sure. Yeah. So uh, essentially, after the age of piracy, up until the 1960s, this thing was absolutely forgotten about. Why do you think that is? Uh, location. Well, uh, uh, um, one is location. Okay. Two, the lack of, of, of media coverage. Okay. This was an isolated, back then, an isolated area of Florida. Oh. We're not in Los Angeles or, or, or New York City sure. uh, or, or Cape Cod. And, uh, and it just didn't have the media coverage to... Uh, to do the, the, the proper uh, justification of, of a historical event. Mm, okay. So now when you thought about writing about this, uh, this event and the, all the stuff around it, what made you want to go with this uh, storyized? I don't even know if that's a word. I'm going to make it up. That storyized version of it sure. rather than just mm-hmm. writing, say like a straight history book about it. What was that? What was your thought process? There? Well, 
That, Phil, it's interesting you say that because originally I was writing this for education purposes as a supplement ah. to a textbook okay. on the age of piracy uh-huh. and especially um, uh, the East Coast of Florida and, and how we were, the economy of the world was really dependent upon the, uh, the triangular trade from Africa uh, to the West Indies sure. and then uh, back to the colonies and, of course, back to Europe. Right. Uh, but the economy was really dependent upon that triangular trade back in the uh, back in the 1700s. Uh-huh. So it started out as a as a supplement to a textbook, and so uh, my son would um, inquire, and he's the one that gave me the thought. He said, "Dad, man, you got to put this stuff in writing, right? <laughs> and and then and then create a, a book out of uh-huh. it." And so that was that's what gave me the edge, uh, because I would tell the stories time and time again, and people would actually, you know, want to know more. Well, tell me more. Sure. And so once people want to say, tell me more, now you know you have something. Absolutely. Of, of substance. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's what started the whole thing. So uh, I gathered all my notes for uh, literally 30 years and uh, and uh, put the piece of the, of the puzzle together, and uh, which took 19 months in itself. Uh-huh. And then, uh, and then of course, 1715, Black Sales, 1715 now. Uh, uh, took off. Sure. Yeah. By the way, it's it's doing wonderful. I, I got to tell you two things here. This yeah. came out uh, the last 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 March. Okay. Uh, it's a five star on Amazon. Nice. Uh, which I'm very very proud of. Uh, and and the most interesting thing was out of nowhere, uh, I received a video, uh-huh. and this gentleman is talking about my book, oh. and it's James Patterson of all people. Oh, nice. I know. I'm shocked. I'm like, you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so James uh, Patterson, uh, the number one author in the world, uh, had caught uh, eye on to it, and uh, I'd like to read you a quote he had sent to me sure. uh, and, and it verbalized on the video. It says, you'll definitely have, I quote, by the way, you'll definitely have a strong reaction one way or the other <laughs> to this one. This is from Black Sail 1715, and I winced, and my legs quivered as well. Nice. An and interesting opening, definitely going to continue to read down the page. Can't beat that. So that's my gold and silver, so to speak. Yeah, that's my gold and silver and the five star on Amazon. So and I'm extremely pleased and being relatively new on the market. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic. If any of your, if any of your leader uh, listeners uh, um, would like to purchase the book, uh, they can, uh, it's on Amazon, and just type in Black Sales 1715, and they can order uh, the uh, the novel through the, through Amazon. And it's twenty three ninety five, including shipping. Okay, yeah, and I'll make sure that all that is linked up in the show notes too. So now, when you were when you were titling it, were you trying to? I mean, because Black Sales, obviously, we think of the TV show. Now, were were you writing it before that, or were you trying to connect it to just the zeitgeist on that? I've been asked that question quite a few times for those who people who know about the series and the book, and that and that, that just came out of coincidence because Black Sales was a uh, was a term used. Uh-huh. Uh, for uh, in the age of piracy, right. that's what they would do. Uh, if I'm about to t- attack you, Phil, uh-huh. I raise my black sail. Right. I'm giving you warning. I'm about to attack you. Uh-huh. So, uh, so that's not um, the, the name itself is uh, has been used uh, historically uh, for the past 300 plus years. Sure, happy coincidence, and it certainly can't hurt. <laughs> I'm gonna have to say probably simultaneous. Okay. To the series coming out as well, it uh, and, and it certainly fits um, because of that, that's exactly what happened off the east coast of Florida. Uh, you have a, a you have a uh, it's called the Silver Plate Fleet, right? Uh, with with just millions in gold and silver and emeralds. Uh-huh. Uh, at the same time uh, during the age of piracy. Yeah, and certainly from a from a marketing point of view, it's actually really fantastic because it, it is centered around sort of the same story and the same time period and things like that. So that, that definitely has to be helpful. The answer is yes, uh, but keep in mind the same characters uh-huh. in the in this series, uh, with the exception of Long John Silver. Sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a different story in itself. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> uh, but but the but the rest of the cast and characters, uh, Calico Jack, Mary Reed, and Bonnie, um, Charles Vane, all those characters you see in the series uh, were, were real people, sure. real pirates, yep. and uh, and so there's some wonderful stories there as well uh, that that's in the novel there, and it's all interlinking with one another. Yeah. So you said you're working on a, a, a next book, a sequel to it, or a further explanation of it. What's that going to be all about? Well, actually, actually, I'm working on two. Okay. Um, the one is, requires a tremendous amount of research trying to find out 
who were the people on board. Mm, oh, right. Um, yeah. yeah, Black Sail 1750 essentially was written from uh, the point of view of uh, the fleet itself, of course, sure. and then uh, all of the pirates that came up out of out of, the, uh, out of Jamaica and, and, and Bahamas mm-hmm. to take and plunder what they want and, and then run off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the second one uh, will be a companion book to Black Sail 1715. Okay, and I, I can't tell you the amount of time I have spent so far trying to come up with um, who were these people. Yeah, and at this stage of the game, I only have 76 names huh. of the um, of the 1,500 that were on on board. Uh, just about every every lead I get, I, I run down and chase it down. Yeah. And, and it always comes up. I always come up empty with it. Huh. Interesting. Uh, but the but the uh, the second novel is I'm, I'm reading as I'm um, writing as we speak, and even right before you called, uh, is called the Goat with a Glass Eye. Okay. And that's a wonderful story. Also, um, it's a takeoff of chapter chapter four uh, in the in the novel. Okay. And what occurred there was uh, just briefly, um, Black Sam Bellamy. His girlfriend was Maria Hallett. Okay. Uh, Black Sam is in his 20s. Uh, Maria's uh, a teenager. She's 15. Uh-huh. And right before they left Cape Cod, he and Paul's grave Williams to sail from Cape Cod down to Vero Beach, present day Vero Beach. Uh-huh. She became pregnant. Black Sam did not know that at the time. Okay. And in her, her hamlet uh, in Massachusetts, uh, obviously she was disowned. Oh, okay. Uh, so Maria. Um, was disowned by the town. Uh, she was disowned by her mom and dad, and she had the baby in her uncle's barn. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and as she was delivering the baby, she, you know, it's a young young kid, uh, teenager, uh, dis- disowned, abandoned by herself. Uh-huh. Uh, when the when the baby was uh, was born, uh, I hate to read, I hate to say this because it's an interesting part of the book for those who purchase it. But what occurred was that uh, she put straw in the baby's mouth okay. and suffocated. Oh gosh! Yes, oh gosh! Yeah. So, um, and now Black Sam Bellamy's only son is now dead right. at the hands of his girlfriend. Uh-huh. Um, after Black Sam Bellamy made his millions, literally, uh-huh. uh, he headed on back to Cape Cod. This is a fascinating story. Uh, he headed on back to Cape Cod to prove to Maria Hallett's mom and dad that he was worthy after all. Okay. <laughs> now look at me. Yeah. I've gone from a pauper sailor, penniless sailor. Right. Now I'm worth millions. Yeah. Am I now worthy of your daughter? Uh, was he upset with her for killing the kid or was it a few dodge that bullet kind of thing? Well, he didn't know. Oh, he, he didn't know. Okay. He, he, he never knew. Okay. He didn't know at that time, nor did he ever know. And what, the reason why he did I not see. know okay. is because his ship was called the, was called the White Up. Uh-huh. Some pronounce it the Widow. Yep. W H Y D D A H went down also in a hurricane. Right. Yes. The irony of that was that Maria was um, up on the hillside uh, waiting for the ship to come in. Ah, wow. And then uh, and then a hurricane uh, had caught Black Sam Bellamy's ship, and then everyone uh, drowned in that hurricane as well. Sure. With the exception, I think six people that that survived that. Uh-huh. But here you have a, uh, a young teenager. She's running up and down the shoreline looking for her lover, Black Sam, uh-huh. uh, on, on the beach uh, and, and obviously not finding him. Sure. And then a subsequent, he, she found out he, he drowned. So Black Sam, he, he never knew he had a son, nor did he ever know that Maria killed the baby. Uh-huh, I see. Yes. And then Suffoc- suffocated the baby. She never knew. Yeah. And then that's a whole nother story. Yeah. Well, here's what happened. Is, uh, it's called Wells. The town was called Wells Fleet. Massachusetts, uh-huh. a small hamlet, uh, Puritan, uh, in every sense of the word. Keep in mind, this is also the days of the Salem witch trials. Sure. Uh, the town of um, that she lived in, Wells Street, uh, uh, considered her at one point in time a, a witch as well. Okay. So she went to live on a uh, on a cliffside uh, by herself, and she befriended a um, what probably was a slave who escaped. Sure. And, and and they took um, comfort in each other's company. Okay. Uh, they had built a hut uh, up on top of the the, uh, the cliff side, again waiting for Black Sam to come back. Okay. And uh, and then and then again a, a hurricane had hit. Mm-hmm. Um, the irony of that is that uh, which always caught my eye. Well, there is a the hut that they had built on the on the on the uh, cliff. Uh-huh. Uh huh. There was a goat. There was a goat huh. outside of the tent okay. protecting both of them. Ah. 
and he all he, and he had a funny eye. <laughs> and so, uh, and so the new novel I'm writing is the goat with a glass eye. Nice. Beware the guard goat. <laughs> yeah. Watch out for that goat with that glass <laughs> eye. But again, it's historic fiction. It's based upon the triangular trade off of Africa uh-huh. into West Indies and, and the economy. So there's a lot of history behind it. But again, it's, it's historic fiction. And I, a lot of twists and turns. I use uh, uh, James Patterson's method of writing. Okay. Uh, I have this outline. And so uh, every chapter I write, I go back, I make sure I have the elements of Charles Patter- uh, of James Patterson's elements in each chapter to, you know, to obviously to keep the, the reader's interest and with twists and turns. Sure. Good plan to follow. He's doing it right. Yeah, yep. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, not a, yeah, not a bad guy to follow, yeah. right? So, uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm writing that as we speak. Great. Well, that's fantastic, man. So the book is on uh, on Amazon, and uh, and you have a website too, which is Black Sales seventeen fifteen, right? Which is all about the book. Yes, Black Sales seventeen fifteen dot com. Any place else where people can keep track of you online? Do you have Facebook, Twitter, any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, fa- uh, Facebook. Um, same thing. Black Sales seventeen fifteen. Okay. I have two pages uh, on, on Facebook. One is a professional page uh-huh. for the novel itself, and but on the personal page, they can obviously uh, add me as their friend under, under my, my, my name. Great. I, it's kind of a quick, neat quotation I have at the very beginning. Uh, it was by Mark Twain, uh-huh. if I can quote. It says, now and then we had a hope that if we lived and were good, God would permit us to be pirates. Ah, nice. That's great. <laughs> but, and that's, leave, leave it to Mark Twain, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny because I've uh, I live in uh, in California, and I've played a lot of gigs in the Gold Country area where he was hanging out a lot when he was writing the Jumping Frog Calaveras County and stuff. And I've played some of the old, old, old hotels that are still there from his time. And I stand in those uh-huh. spots telling jokes, uh, and I feel like. Mark Twain probably told way better jokes while he was standing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, but at least it's the same spot, right? Yep, yep. And I'm, his were probably just as dirty, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's well, great. Well, initially I started off the book besides James Patterson. I, I, I use his outline. Uh-huh. But I try to, uh, I, I say try, because uh, it's very difficult to do, to write uh, in the style uh-huh. of Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, sure, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, really. Um, so... Um, he, he right off the bat, the very first chapter, verse first page, he always likes to the reader to be uh, punched in the forehead, so to speak. Uh-huh, sure. uh, and typically, it, it's sadistic, and so I, I, I had a hard time with that. Uh, and I, I rewrote the first chapter literally over thirty times. Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, yeah, it was because I wanted to uh, portray what happened without being um, considered. Um, uh, vulgarity, oh, okay. or, or or this this is this is just not right. Right. Uh, and what occurred in the first chapter is a friend of mine. His name is Mike Daniel, uh-huh. and Mike um, found Queen Anne's Revenge. Mm, yes. Which was which was Blackbeard's ship. Uh-huh. And uh, one of the things that Mike had found uh, on one of his dives uh, was um, syringes. Oh. And the syringes still had mercury inside of them after three hundred years. Oh wow. And uh, and I don't and the reason why there's syringes that were uh, were still filled with mercury is because most the vast majority of Blackbeard's crew uh, had uh, uh, syphilis. Sure, yeah, that was the cure at the time. And so mm, that was a cure. So the uh, the ship's physician would take the uh, the uh, the syringe and inject uh, mercury up the uh, urethra uh-huh. to kill the, uh, the syphilis. <laughs> so I thought, boy, that's a, that's a, there's a curtain body again, right off the bat, first page. Wow. Like, oh, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And it's true, right? So, Well, no wonder James Patterson's legs <laughs> so, uh, were shaking. <laughs> and the, wonder, the wonder he said, I went too. Yeah. <laughs> and my legs, and my legs quivered. So uh, anyway, I, that's, that's where, that's where that first chapter came from as a, Combination of Vonnegut and style of writing, of, of writing and, and 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 what was found on Queen Anne's Revenge. Interesting. So, That's great. Interesting story. Yeah, well, it's a great story. A great at first chapter. Like I said, I, I rewrote it thirty times. Yeah. Oh, I understand. <laughs> and uh, I had a wonderful editor, and lots of kudos to her as well. Uh-huh. And she did a, a line edit uh, using the Chicago Manual style of writing, which is uh, which is where if you want to be taken considered uh, considered to be uh, serious a writer, then you. Uh, that's the type of uh, line edit that that you need sure. from uh, from a, an editor. So yeah. it's a long process. Uh, it's a it's a it's a puzzle of history that you're putting the pieces together. Uh, you want to be accurate and factual uh-huh. as much as possible from all the 
the manifest and the documentations that uh, that you have on file, and then and then and then you write the story from there. Right. Yes. So that's great. That's man. pretty much the background. There's a there's a lot in the novel. Obviously, that we haven't discussed uh, as far as Horny Gold and Blackbeard and from the background of the uh, two captains, Jubilio. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's why everybody's got to go buy the book. Yeah, I hope. So. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> like I said, I'm very happy. It's a, like I said, it's a five star on, on Amazon, and uh, and uh, I get a lot of compliments, uh, not any, even by email, but those that are running uh, the uh, reviews on Amazon as well. So I'm really happy, Phil. I, and I like the education part as well. That's great. Uh, I do a I do a ton of book signings. Um, in December is just absolutely tied up with Starbucks uh, sending me to location to location to location. Oh, nice. Uh, I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of uh, book signings for Pirate Fest and and uh, Treasure, uh, the uh, Seafood Fest. So that's pretty much my audience. Sure. Um, those and those in history buffs. Yep. From the age of piracy. That's great. So I'm very pleased, and I thank you. I thank you for this. Uh, podcast interview oh absolutely very cool oh you are too man thank Thank you very very much yeah i hope we can uh, hook up next time i'm down in florida okay again thank you very 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 much and i hope your listeners uh uh purchased the book obviously uh from the educational point of view as well it's a great story it's a great read and uh i know your listeners are pretty much of my audience so to speak and uh but it, it, it's worthwhile, and you know you can tell any audience out there right now if they don't like it, I'll give them their money back. There you go. That's how, my, that's how, conf- <laughs> that's how confident I am that they will enjoy this book. I like it from the author's mouth. Excellent, Alan. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. All righty. Bye bye, Phil. Bye bye. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with Alan Baylog. Be sure to pick up his book, Black Sales 1715. You can pick it up on Amazon. And uh, the best way to do that, if you want to help support everybody, come to underthecrossbones.com slash 085. I will have a link for you in the show notes directly to the book where you can pick it up, and that would be awesome. Uh, what a fun interview, though. What a good guy knows a lot of stuff. And I did not know that much about the 1715 a treasure fleet uh, before digging into this interview. I'd done a little bit of reading, so I was kind of prepared. Uh, but um, yeah, fascinating. Uh, really interesting stuff. And that there's still so much down there to be brought up is craziness and that it's only in waist high water. Uh, I feel like we should all learn how to swim in waist high uh, ocean water. It's warmer over there too on the East Coast. We got cold ocean water here on the West Coast. It's it's no fun. Uh, but anyway, go, go grab the book, Black Sail 1715 uh, by Alan Baylog. And uh, I think you will enjoy it. It's a it's a quite quite a good read, as they say, as they say. I I don't know who says that. I say that, uh, and I'm going to stop talking now. Under the Crossbones is sponsored by Pirate Radio, the Treasure Coast, WKKC DB, playing the best music and pirate talk uh, radio. Uh, listen to this show, Under the Crossbones, on both of their stations. Just go to Pirate Radio, the Treasure Coast dot com or Pirate Radio TC dot com. And don't forget to download the apps. There's the Pirate Radio Treasure Coast app, which is the music station, and Pirate Radio Talk, which is the talk station. Uh, Do me a quick favor. Need a little favor from you, if you would. I have a little survey for you to fill out, and it helps me learn more about you, uh, my my valued listener, and what I should be doing with the show in the future. So it's very quick. Uh, It's like seven questions. Take you 30 seconds to do, and it would help me a whole bunch. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash survey, and uh, like I said, takes you 30 seconds and super helpful. That's underthecrossbones.com slash survey. Have you left me a voicemail yet to play in the show? I don't think you have because there's a lot of you listening and there's a lot of you I haven't heard from yet. If you've been to a pirate event lately, a festival uh, or a charity event or a pirate band concert or any sort of piratey event that you've been to, I would like to hear about it. And if you uh, send me a nice little cool trip report, I will uh, play it on the show just like we did uh, last week. And uh, it's lots of fun. So here's the number. You're going to call 408 599 2733. Again, it's 408 599 2733. And that is my Google voice number. Just leave me a voicemail there and I will play it on the show uh, with your travel report from uh, whatever cool piratey event you were at. All right, friends, that is our show for today. Thank you once again for tuning in. Be sure to come check out all the show notes under the crossbones.com slash 085. Again, you can get Alan Baylog's book, Black Sail 1715, at Amazon. Click our link on the website that in the show notes. That would be helpful. Or you can go directly to blacksales1715.com to find out more. Make sure you're subscribed. 
Keep leaving those iTunes reviews. Those are always nice to see. And tell your friends about the show because that's how the show can go. And uh, I hope to see you on the road when I'm in the Midwest next week. All right. Talk to you then. Bye.